Uh, just, just out of curiosity, how many people here have seen the show Hamilton or listened to the music? Well, it's quite, quite a few, uh, as I, as I would have, as I would have figured, uh, which makes setting the stage here a lot, a lot easier. Um, many of you uh, then know the the basic story about Alexander, Alexander Hamilton, uh, who uh, Eliza Schuyler was, and. Um, and the joys and anguish of their marriage, and those of you who don't know all the details are soon going to, to hear about them. Uh, our guest this evening is Elizabeth Cobbs, um, who is both uh, an historian and a novelist, a and her new book, uh, The Hamilton Affair, uh, is a work of historical fiction. Uh, it's faithful to what is known about Hamilton's life, uh, but takes some liberty in filling in the blanks. Elizabeth is a history professor at Texas A&M. She's written several other books, some straight history, uh, s uh, others uh, fiction, uh, and she's won literary prizes in both categories. Uh, she also has ventured into documentaries and, and her first PBS film, American Umpire, uh, which she wrote and, and co-produced and is based on her book of the same name about U.S. foreign policy, uh, debuts this fall. Uh, a review of, of the Hamilton Affair in Kirkus praised the book for holding its own among uh, other works about Hamilton, quote, even without catchy tunes. Um, and Publishers Weekly said the book should, should appeal to both biography enthusiasts and fiction lovers. Uh, my favorite review line, though, comes from the Miami Herald, which uh, borrowed a phrase from the hit musical saying Elizabeth's portrait of the Hamiltons quote, makes you feel like you are in the room where it happened. <laughs> uh, this event, by the way, uh, is also being featured in WAMU's uh, In Your Bookstore series. And so uh, Elizabeth will be in conversation here with Ruth Tam, a producer with the Kojo Nambi Show. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth and Ruth. Here's the first hard trick. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You made it okay, the it chairs. works. <laughs> thank you so much for coming out here, and thank you so much to Politics and Prose for hosting us. Um, I'm Ruth Tam. I'm a producer at the Kojo Namdi Show. Um, and just to reiterate, WAMU in Your Bookstore is an event series and the brainchild of fellow Kojo Namdi Show producer Taylor Burney. Um, it, uh, it's a series that brings station reporters and producers out to DC bookstores to have talks with local and visiting authors. Um, whether in, uh, you're in the room where it happens or you know you can't make it out that night, you can check out our, our schedule at WAMU.org slash books. And you can hang out with us online with the hashtag WAMU Books. Um, so let's get started. Um, obviously, you've heard about the musical Hamilton. Um, and before the musical really took off the nation into a history and rap-obsessed craze, historian Elizabeth Hobbs was working on um, a novel that would tell the story of founding father Alexander Hamilton and the philanthropist, his wife, Elizabeth Schuyler. Um, so I'm just really wondering, uh, you were working on this book before the musical really took off. Um, how did you first get started in telling his story? And um, what did people think when you first told them that this is what you were working on? Well, people looked at me very blankly when I told them this is what I was working on. I had some friends, I said, I am working on the sexiest man in the American Revolution, <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. And she, and she just looked at me and she couldn't believe that I would could even think this, like those words do not go together. <laughs> Sexy and American Revolution, they're like, they're in different rooms. And so I started working on it. Partly a friend of mine, another historian, a wonderful historian named Catherine Clinton, said, why don't you write your next novel about Alexander Hamilton? And I thought, well, that's, that's a good idea because, you know, uh, my husband's a filmmaker and he's always told me that bad villains, really bad villains, make for really good movies. And I thought, yeah, and Alexander Hamilton, Gosh, because as a trained historian, and I, I got my PhD at Stanford, I taught about Alexander Hamilton as I had been taught, which was that he was a monarchist, that he was this coldly logical man, that he was a manipulator, a schemer, important, but you know, someone you really had to keep your eye on. 
And so I thought, well, okay, good, a good, I, I'm, a, I'm such an optimist. I'm, I'm looking for a bad guy, like I need one. And then I started reading about Alexander Hamilton, and I not only read, of course, the Ron Chernow biography and many other biographies, but I read his papers. I read the diaries of men who had served alongside him. I traveled actually to Nevis, where he was born, and St. Croix, where he grew up. And I traveled up to Saratoga and Albany, where his wife, Eliza Schuyler, grew up. And the longer I looked at this guy, I realized, you know, he wasn't a rapper, but he had gotten a bum rap. Shocker. <laughs> I know, he wasn't a rapper. He looks good as a rapper, though, let's face it. So, um, so I started working on this book about five years ago. And then about, you know, four years ago, after I you was know, seriously into it, a friend said, oh, you're not going to believe this. There's like somebody on YouTube, some guy at the White House, did a thing about Alexander Hamilton. And I'm like, my gosh, isn't that interesting? So I go on, and it's this guy I've never seen before, Lin-Manuel Miranda fella. You've heard of him. And, and he does this funny thing where he, um, he starts to tell the Obamas, you know, I'm going to do, a, 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 my next musical is about a man who I think embodies the spirit of rap, Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> and they laugh just like you're laughing now. They're like, oh, that's like so silly. How funny is that? And, um, but of course, he then makes it work. And, um, and I tried selling the novel. This is my sixth book. So I've had some experience publishing, and it was really hard. The publishers are like, Alexander Hamilton, like, who's going to be interested in that? So, what an honor and what a delight to have all of you here caring as I do, and ultimately, I hope, caring even more about Alexander Hamilton. So besides the letters of uh, John and Abigail Adams, very few stories of the Founding Fathers involve their wives. And I'm just curious, um, because in your book, uh, you know, Alexander and Elizabeth Schuyler, his wife, take turns as the narrator. How did you, um, what were your motives in treating Alexander Hamilton's story as one half of a larger narrative? Eliza Schuyler wasn't somebody I'd ever heard of. You know, never would have occurred to me to think even about this person. And it's just that when you think about um, what happened in their marriage, when you think about the lives that they led together, when you think about a woman who had eight children and was there alongside her husband and then had to raise those children without him, and then I found that you know she went on to found some of the New York's most important public institutions. I mean, here's a woman who at the height of her public humiliation steps into public service. <coughs> rather than taking that moment to go hide under a rock, says, now's when I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk into my own life. And uh, so, you know, I just, it gives me goosebumps. I'm serious. I tell you, I have goosebumps when I think about Eliza Schuyler. Let's talk about that public humiliation. For those who aren't aware, what was um, perhaps her lowest moment in public life? Uh, well, this can't be too much of a spoiler alert, because if you've known anything, which I'm sure you all do about the musical, if, which is a brilliant, brilliant work of art, she found out when she was eight months pregnant, eight and a half months pregnant, that her husband uh, not only had had an affair five years earlier, but was going to publish the entire story of this affair. And uh, in order to counter charges that uh, instead of paying blackmail to um, the husband of his lover that he was playing, paying somebody to buy stocks for him in the Bank of the United States. And there was nothing, nothing more important to Alexander Hamilton than the future of his country. And he felt that the future of his country was at stake. And so he revealed this. And poor Eliza it was New York in July, and she's that far gone and being pregnant. And how was this scandal received? You know, there have been political sex scandals since the beginning of time, and someone say, someone say that um, Hamilton's affair with this woman, Mariah Reynolds, was really the big, the first big American sex scandal. Um, how was it received? Is there anything familiar about, um, you know, how it got splashed out in the media and how his political rivals used it to their advantage? Well, stay tuned for the next couple of months, and... Uh, <laughs> I think uh, you know, s sex scandals are, have always been a part of American history. You know, there are six, seven, eight presidents who usually after they left office it was revealed like Jack Kennedy or 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Dwight Eisenhower that things had gone on during the marriage, and not always, but sometimes even while they were in office. But the big difference in the Hamilton affair, so to speak, is that it's the only one I know of, I think, certainly, I, I believe the only one that where it happened, that the public figure came forward and voluntarily offered more information than was required. <laughs> That journalist loved him. Yeah, I think it might, might have been a really bad idea, by the way. All his friends told him it was a bad idea. He even apologizes to his friends in the pamphlet that he publishes disclosing the affair. He's just like, sorry that I'm even stooping to this level in acknowledging this. But he, he doesn't apologize to his wife, though. Right, but of course, part of the backstory, I mean, with Alexander Hamilton and with anybody, there's a lot of backstory. I mean, his, his mother was imprisoned as a loose woman. Now, he was a bastard, I hear somebody saying off to the side, which is true. And the reason why he was considered illegitimate is because his mother fled her first husband, who was a fortune hunter, and ran her fortune into the ground. And she, we don't know why she left him, but probably for good reasons. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's a likely thing. And in the day, he could, he could prosecute her and tell lies up one side of the room and down the other about why she ran away. Right, because you have to remember back in the day there was not like, there was no advantage to her leaving her husband. She didn't have means and, you know, she wasn't able to, like, if she was going to anger her husband, he wasn't going to allow her, um, you know, a reasonable divorce settlement or anything. So, like, it would make every relation she had with someone else afterwards, you know, illegitimate or wrong. Right, well, actually, the court ruled that she could never marry again. He could marry as much as he wanted. I mean, he could marry somebody and you know, they died, he could marry another person. But she was never allowed to marry again. And so, and by the way, that was an innovation in the United States in early, the early republic, is that some states ruled that divorced women could marry again. And so what happened is his mother, uh, the, the man she was first married to, he could marry again, but she could not. And that's why her liaison with his father, even though she called herself Mrs. Hamilton, was considered illegitimate. And so he grew up with this terrible stain on his honor, on his mother's honor, and so honor was a, a big deal for him. Right, and as a boy, just outside of his, um, his coming up into being into the world as a bastard and uh, later as an orphan when his mother passed away so early in his life he was you know adopted by a cousin who committed suicide you know what did this what impact did it have on him and you know did this affect how he viewed marriage or fatherhood later in life with Elizabeth I think it does one of the things I really enjoyed about writing the book and of course there's so many fun parts of writing a book about someone you really become so interested in but I really thought, and I know this is going to sound boring, so pardon me, but uh, I thought it was so interesting, their own approach to family. I mean, these were people who had eight kids. So what was he like as a father? Or what was she like as a mother? This, and especially for women, and you asked earlier about how do you wrap the lives of women into a life about somebody who's much more famous, you know, a, a founding father. And you've got to remember, these women are like, having babies, you know, like one after another. And what did that mean? How, how did you live your life? How did you, you know, uh, how did you interface with the rest of the world? Um, what did that, what was that experience like? So I just had real fun exploring. And he was the kind of dad who, um, you know, when mom was away, the boys would climb in bed with him and they'd sleep with him and he'd walk him to school. You know, so that touched my heart. One thing I did really love about your book is um, how it doesn't gloss over the reality of being a mother back in the day. You know, she um, was having you know many children one after another, and um, it really affects you know how she lives her life, how she plans her life, how she approaches her husband, and um, that is definitely not passed over in a way that kind of um, prettifies her life from that era. Um, and just <laughs> um, getting back to Hamilton as um, a sexy founding father, um, <laughs> that was not, that did not pass over me. I mean, when I first read Alexander Hamilton's writings, I was taking, when, when I first spent time in DC, I was uh, enrolled in a constitutional law class and I was trying to uh, poll my classmates if they were interested in me making a t-shirt with Alexander, Alexander Hamilton's portrait on it with the words, Foxiest Founding Father, as a caption. 
I think some people were interested. I did not get nearly enough um, <laughs> names to actually go through with this. But if anybody, if anybody here wants <laughs> Alexander Hamilton, Foxy's founding father shirt, let me know, I'll hook you up. Um, anyway, he was obviously known as being a ladies man and I wanted to know how important it was to you to include scenes that reflected that and um, you know, what was going through your mind when you recreated these intimate scenes between him and Elizabeth and him and Mariah Reynolds, um, how big of, of his character was that to include? Well, I thought it was very important to include, although it was also kind of funny for me because I am a professional historian, I make serious documentaries and I write about foreign policy. So that's not the kind of thing people are, you know, they're not usually, you know, there's no Harlequin romance version of American foreign policy, though it's yet to be written. <laughs> I'm sure it exists on the internet. <laughs> so so I, was, I felt a little funny about it, but I also thought, again, you, you have to go where that story is, right? And he was 34 when he had this affair. So, you know, he's a young guy. And he, this is the only time in their married life where they did not have children for four years. Now, she's having children, otherwise, you know, year after year, you know, eight kids, you know, every other year they have a new baby. So there's four years where they don't have a new baby and he has an affair. Hmm. I'm just saying that's kind of some interesting timing there. <laughs> so I felt that the sex scenes were a part of it, you know. I wanted everybody to go, wow, Foxiest founding father. <laughs> Can I get that t-shirt? And there, you're not the only person that's kind of amped that up a little bit. You know, the creator of the, the hit musical, Lin-Manuel Miranda, he wrote something of a love triangle between Hamilton and Elizabeth and Elizabeth's sister, Angelica. Is there any truth to that tension? Yeah, I don't think so historically. And, and this is kind of fun for me because when you have a book out, then people weigh in on, you know, Goodreads and Amazon and, you know, politics and prose. Perhaps we'll have a website and people will say, you know, I'm not sure she's got her facts straight because wasn't there that whole love triangle? Because they've heard the musical. And, um, and, and Miranda moves some pretty key facts around and changes them for the sake of dramatization, which is you know, perfectly fine, and he acknowledges that in the book uh, that he wrote, the wonderful book about the libretto. But as a historian, I, that's like, I can't go, I cannot go there. Like, I'm like ridiculous, you know, when it comes to try the things we do know, I don't like to change those because I figure that readers want to be able to rely that, you know, as much as you can in fiction, which is not 100%, that much of what I tell you is exactly what happened, and then our recreation of it. But um, in terms of the tension between Angelica and Schuyler, I mean, to me, it's an older sister, younger sister thing. And I, by the way, I have an older sister who is so beautiful. I <laughs> am an older sister. <laughs> OK. So exactly, girlfriend, right? So, so we know that Angelica Schuyler was considered the wittier, the funnier, the more flirtatious of the older sisters. I'm sure she was great at a party. But Eliza is the person you would have wanted to have by your side throughout your life. Right, and I remember you telling me earlier that you know in the musical, uh, it's kind of set up that both sisters meet him at the exact same time, and they both have you know maybe some chance of a claim to him or whatever. But you know, the truth is that Hamilton actually met Angelica after she was married and actually pregnant, I believe. I think it was on her second child. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, M Miranda fans. I mean, it was you know. He did change, she, he changed that up quite a bit. And that's partly, by the way, it goes back to your earlier question, Ruth, about what happened when he made the confession. And of course, this is what his friends said. If you say you're guilty about one thing, your political opponents will say you're guilty of anything and everything. And so this whole story about, you know, well, he must have had like 25 affairs then. There's no other affair that's documented. This guy was watched like a hawk. If there had been another affair, it's reasonable we would have found out about it. Um, so they said, you know, and then of course, I mean, I think that people said, well, and maybe he had the hots for Angelica, because they did have a very close relationship. And also, by the way, we think we're flirtatious in the 21st century. We're just more obvious. They were more clever, really, mostly about these things, but they were outrageously flirtatious in the 18th century. So you can read about him flirting, uh, you know, in his letters, et cetera, I mean, about with, with Angelica and with Peggy. But the way I think of that as being more that he wanted to show how much he loved his sister-in-laws. So, you know, he'd be complimenting their dress and she'd say, maybe you should share him and things like that. But 
I think that it's more plausibly a part of the larger way that people related to each other in that era. Right, so Miranda obviously then takes liberties with his interpretation of history, and you also have to do the same because um, you told me earlier that your approach to historical fiction is, you know, you're kind of having to connect the dots, and you don't, the dots are facts, and you don't move where the dots are, but you kind of have to write in between, you know, what happens between the events that you know happened, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. Um, can you tell me about your philosophy, your, your approach to that, and you know, in what ways you connected the dots in this book? Well, for example, I don't think that you can connect the dots by making up wildly improbable things. Like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to invent things I thought weren't likely also to have been the case. But, for example, I do introduce an entirely, oh, I, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, but there's a character who's not at all a real person. Uh, and his name is Ajax Manley. Now, by the way, there was a, an actual true person in Alexander La Hamilton's life named Ajax, who is about his age, who was his slave when he, Hamilton was a young boy in St. Croix. And when all of Eliza Schuyler, uh, pardon me, uh, Rachel Lavian Hamilton's p belongings were sold out off upon her death, so this slave, young slave was sold. But in, th in that era in slavery, it was often common that young children, white and black, would play together when they were very young. And so I made him his friend. And then I introduced another character um, who he meets. Now this is the made up part whom he meets uh, in the Revolution. But there were many African-American, many black soldiers in the American Revolution, actually quite a large percentage. And so I made them friends. But I did that, and this goes back to your question about why. You know, what do you make up and why? And one thing I wanted to get across, I wanted to be able to show, was that Hamilton was only one of two founders who were at the level of the folks we really, whose names we, we know still today, like, him and also Benjamin Franklin were the only founders who were abolitionists. And I found that, again, just a very moving and interesting fact about Alexander Hamilton and something worthy of notice for especially modern audiences. And so it was, it was very interesting to, cre to create a, a character that would allow me to show that part of his, of his life, which was an important part of his life. I mean, you can go to his later letters and he'll be talking about the uh, the New York Society for the Abolition of Slavery. I'm forgetting the exact name of it now. By the way, Aaron Burr was a member also. But by the way, Aaron Burr kept slaves. Now, if you didn't like him before, I hope you're not liking him now. <laughs> I have another question about Burr. Um, Miranda makes the, the relationship between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton seem like this lifelong rivalry, was it, in real life? I don't think so. Uh, again, I, I understand why, from a dramatic point of view, it was important to do that. But certainly they knew each other for many years. Uh, they, we think they probably first met each other in Albany after the Revolution, although they might have met during the Revolution. They were both on, on the battlefield at Monmouth Courthouse, for example, although it was a big battlefield and it was a hot and dusty day. So I don't know if they really knew each other. And certainly it wasn't like his first friend in New York or something. That would have been Hercules Mulligan. Um, but they did know each other. And one of the, again, kind of curious, weird facts is that, first of all, that Aaron Burr represented Mariah Reynolds in her divorce. Whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. It's not, a, well, I think it's in the book. Um, but then the other thing is that, um, I'm remembering, forgetting what I was going to say there, because the reaction was so good there, Ruth. Thank you <laughs> for that. But, uh, Aaron Burr was um, just somebody, he, oh, I know this, about Eliza Schuyler. So you, again, you might think, oh, Eliza Schuyler, she married the guy, then she becomes interesting. No. Eliza Schuyler was the daughter, as was, of course, Angelica, of Philip Schuyler, who was almost the number two general in the American Revolution until politics got him. And the Weasley, Horatio Gates, uh, who everybody remembers as the great hero of Saratoga, actually wasn't the primary general, but he kept nagging Congress. You know, that whole Philip Schuyler guy, I, I think he's terrible, appoint me. And so after Philip Schuyler kind of had Burgoyne cornered, uh, Horatio Gates comes in, sails in, and takes the credit, and, and Philip Schuyler is bounced out. I mean, he's, he's stripped of his command in front of the country. So this is the man, by the way, who trades not swords, but trades the Senate seat back and forth with Aaron Burr in the first part of the government. So actually, Eliza Schuyler, you know, Aaron Burr was somebody that her family had tangled with again and again. 
So let's move on to Hamilton's death. Um, he actually didn't believe in duels, uh, but he met Aaron Burr um, anyway. Why? Well, you are going to have to read the book. Uh, because, I mean, there are various theories about it. I saw a PBS documentary not long ago. It was like, maybe he had a death wish. You know, maybe he was depressed. And I don't, I don't buy any of those stories. Um, so why I think he did, I, I really, I come to that in the book. But uh, let it be said as a sort of a side comment that it really, you know, was about honor. Honor is something we don't, <laughs> I don't want to say, we don't understand today. It's spelled H-O. No, uh, honor is something that really meant a specific kind of thing in that era. And in fact, the very last word of the Declaration of Independence is honor. Upon this, we pledge our sacred honor. And that's not just a flourish at the end. It was with what they really meant. It was a thing that meant the most to them was their honor. And so he, he goes out in defense of his honor. And for those of us who don't regularly challenge our frenemies in gun battles, can you tell us about what duels were like back in the day? You know, what were the rules? What were the expectations? You know, who participated in them and how often did they happen? Well, they would say that you could, you could insult somebody you know, casually over dinner with another friend on a Friday, challenged on a Saturday, and you could be dead on Sunday because duels were very common. I mean, they're more common at different times than other times, but to give you a sense of that the sort of perfect storm, how it hits for someone like Alexander Hamilton, is that the year after the American Declaration of Independence, 1777, is a year in history also because that's when um, a group of Irish gentlemen got together and wrote what was called the Code Duello. And the Code Duello would give you all the rules on, you know, like what's good and what's bad and what's, the, what's you know, acceptable and what's not in a duel. So dueling is very much a part of the American Revolution. It's, there are many people who fight duels. But it's not just an American thing, as the Irish, you know, origins of this code book would indicate. Uh, to give you a sense of this, uh, my favorite example of, as to why, because some people have said, well, Alexander Hamilton's the only founding father who dies in a duel, so therefore he must really have been, you know, half cocked and all that. The foreign minister and the prime foreign minister and minister of war for Great Britain, Canning and Castlereagh, in 1809. I mean, like the highest guys in the government of Great Britain, practically. Uh, well, Canning disses Castlereagh, and Castlereagh channel challenges them to a duel. I mean, this is long after Hamilton's death, five years later. And uh, Canning has never fired a gun in his entire life. He's just one of those nebbishy guys, you know. He never has fired a gun, but of course he must accept Castlereagh's, um, you know, challenge. And so they go out and they duel. So it's a, it's a pretty significant phenomenon. So we have time for a couple of questions. So you can start lining up to the mics on either side and we can go to questions in a bit. Um, I have a couple more myself. Um, historians aside, most people know Aaron Burr as the man who ended Hamilton's life. But what happened to him after he shoots Hamilton? How does he find his way to the city that we're in now? Yes, well, uh Aaron Burr, there wasn't really a, a federal police back then. There was no FBI. There weren't really federal, many federal laws, in fact. And so Aaron Burr is actually wanted for murder in two states. There are subpoenas out for his arrest in New York and in New Jersey. So he goes where he's safe, which is Washington, D.C., uh, where he uh, presides, of course, because he is the vice president of the United States oh, at yeah. the time. So he presides over the Senate, and apparently he wielded the gavel very elegantly. It was said that his decisions after this time were very judicious. You know, you're out of order. You may speak next. Could you please lower your voice? Things like that. Um, so he, he served out his term as vice president. Later, by the way, he had other crazy cockamamie schemes. Ultimately, was tried for treason in the United States, a different charge than the murder of Alexander Hamilton. And so Elizabeth Schuyler goes on to live another 50 years after Hamilton dies. Um, you know, what, what does she use with the, what does she do with the rest of her time? And, um, you know, how does she, what's her relationship with DC? I love Elizabeth Schuyler. Let me make that really clear. She comes back and lives out, and when she's in her 80s, her children finally say, you know, Mom, 
you've really got to stop this. Because she was living on her own uh, up in Harlem, which is where their house is, the house that Hamilton built but died before he really got to live there any, any real length of time. Uh, she becomes an, an enormously important and influential person in New York. She also comes down and is one of the chief fundraisers for the Washington Monument. So when you see the monument, you thank uh, Eliza Schuyler Hamilton and also Dolly Madison. And uh, she comes down and she lives here into her 90s, and, uh, and, her ch and one of her children comes and lives here. So Washington, D.C. was very important to her. And the world will always know what Hamilton felt about his own affair, but uh, her you know, opinion of it, her reaction to it, you know, has kind of been lost in history. Um, did she, as the musical suggests, try to erase her, her part of the narrative there? She, we don't have any of Eliza Schuyler Hamilton's letters to her husband. And the ones we have from him are so beautiful and moving. He calls her my dearest life, my charmer, you know, my Betsy. And, uh, and they're just beautiful, beautiful letter after letter from the, you know, the week they met until the day he died. So there are, you know, hundreds probably, I haven't ever counted them, but many, many letters, none from her. Now we know mm. she didn't write as much to him because <laughs> he would chide her. You know, I've written you 50, you know, 10 letters and you've only written me one back. What's with that? Mm -hmm. So she didn't write often, but I, I don't think that it's in the musical and they, they had the affair and she burned the letters because actually she did live for a while long after that. So I, I think that probably a lot of women in that era felt that they should take themselves out of the story, that what was important was their husband's work. And I, I just think that that's the likeliest explanation, but but we'll never know. Well, thank you for putting her back in the story. Um, so let's go to questions now. Um, let's start on this side. Hi. Uh, if you know the musical, you obviously know John Lawrence. Uh, in your book, you talk about relations with Hamilton, but you never really discuss uh, the letters that he wrote to John Lawrence that were really, really questionable on both sexualities. Uh, why didn't you talk about that? Right, so this question about his relationship with John Lawrence. Some people say the letters he wrote Lawrence were so, again, so intimate. Um, he didn't say, let's go have sex. But, but he said, <laughs> he did not say that. The flirting uh, was more subtle back but, then. But, you know, it, uh, flirting was more subtle, right. I mean, again, we just don't know. I, it didn't seem to me to make sense to try to develop that. I think, you know, likely we would be taking modern values and reading them backwards. Again, how's people, how people spoke with each other, the intimacy that they considered their intimate friends. And that was the word that was used. You are my intimate friend. Now we say today, if I'm gonna be intimate with somebody, we generally think that they're having sex with that person. But that's not how the word was used. So who knows, he did love John Lawrence. And John Lawrence also deserves to be remembered. One of those men shot out of his saddle at the end of the revolution, who, like Hamilton, was an abolitionist. And who, if you ever go online, by the way, and you wanna look up early, you know, slave um, slave uh, sales bills to, to, to sell slaves in the District of Columbia or something. One of the ones that will frequently come up on a search is one from very early in the Republic. And it says something like, Lawrence and Sons. Mm. That's who the purveyor is. Because his family owned the largest um, slave uh, uh, importing business in America. And it was John Lawrence who said, we have to put an end to slavery. If he had lived, America might have had a rather different history. And on this side? Yeah, I, I have just one comment. I don't know if you know that the descendants of Hamilton and Burr are both members of the rowing team in Inwood, and they're friends. Uh, but my question is, um, Inwood in New York, but my question is, I read somewhere that there was so much information that Eliza saved about Hamilton, because all her life she wanted to restore his name and place in history. Is that true, and how did you sift through all that stuff? Uh, that is true, and mm -hmm. Eliza Hamilton you know, commissioned, begged, pleaded different people to write a biography of her husband. Uh, and it's really, you know, what you walk away with, by the way, when you read some of the biographies, like Ron Chernos, which is a fabulous piece of scholarship, you walk away really realizing that Hamilton, to an important extent, created our government. Mm -hmm. and. The machinery of government is something we often belittle but really need to treasure. I mean, he really created the, the systems uh, which, you know, made this 
the country operated as it did. In fact, I think one reason why he was despised by people like Burr to some extent was because he was a triple threat. You know, he was somebody who was a bona fide war hero. I mean, the last charge of the American Revolution is made by Alexander Hamilton holding a sword. Uh, he's one of the great writers of his era. In fact, these papers you're talking about are so voluminous that Hamilton's papers are the first papers of any founder to, to be published. They were published in New York in the early 20th century. And, and they just take, you know, I, I did not read them all. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a fabulous, though. Thank you. For that. That's a great question. Thank you. I've seen the play Hamilton, and listening to what you've said today, I have two questions. The play very much portrays both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison as the biggest whiny wimps in the history of America. They were just, you just wanted to get up out of your seat and smack them. They were such whiners. And then my second question is, the, the play um, insinuates that the duel for Hamilton was death by duel, so that some of the um, hysteria and the talk about his affairs would stop so that his reputation could live on. Any credence to either of those? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> so on, um, I, I do think that, I mean, I certainly, again, as a professional historian, you know, I've taught for 27 years, you know, I do this all the time. I, I walked in with a very different impression of, for example, Madison and also Jefferson and Monroe, especially, than I had walked in with. I walked away with a different impression. And I, I got to tell you, I hate to say this in Virginia. <laughs> We're in the D.C. Oh, right. I'm sorry. that, But you know you're close, right? <laughs> that I, you know, if you go down to Monticello, which I've been to many times, and you read on his famously very you know, uh, modest, uh, uh, the, his gravestone where he mm -hmm. says, I'm only, I, I only care about three things, you know, the Declaration of Freedom, founding of the you know, University of Virginia, and one other thing I'm not remembering. He doesn't mention being U.S. president. And maybe he mentions Louisiana Purchase, I don't recall. But actually, as a historian, I started to work back in my own mind thinking, why did I have such a great impression of Thomas Jefferson. All these years I had this big idea of who Thomas Jefferson was, you know, you, is you accept it. And then I realized, you know, I don't really think he did much. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that he, he was the founder of the opposition party. And every party, party, every party needs a hero sometime. And so the Democratic Party is the only party we still have from our founding. And Jefferson was the founder of the Democratic Party. And, you know, you got to give it to him. Uh, so, you know, I'm, so really when you think about the Louisiana Purchase, okay, well, okay, I can see some doubters out here. I've thought about this a long time, my friend. Well, no, Hamilton was, would have been, you know, the Federalists became the, became the Whigs, became the Republican Party, mm. became something we don't recognize today. So, <laughs> I think most Republicans don't recognize it. But so. were they whiners, like they're portrayed? I don't think they were whiners, no. Okay. So thank you for that. Oh, Thanks for bringing they that. were, the, the stereotype on stage was, real, it was really interesting. Well, it is, it is grotesque to me. For example, at places like Monticello, where you, know, you like to hear about how clever Jefferson was. He made these dumbwaiters that would go up and down, and you wouldn't see. And then you realize later, well, that's so his Lafayette doesn't see the slaves. So there's a, a big character flaw in Thomas Jefferson, in my way of thinking which is not something I feel about George Washington, who freed his slaves, and who never bad-mouthed Jefferson, even though Jefferson worked overtime bad-mouthing Washington. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. On this side. Uh, I guess I have two questions. I, uh, one is in response to the, what uh, you said about Jefferson. Um, although Je uh, Jefferson did many, did, was, uh, had talked very, a good line. He did a lot of tricky politics, not blaming everybody else but himself. In fact, uh, so uh, that uh, there are many things to be negative about him. But I want to get back to Angelica. Um, although I agree with your ultimate conclusion, uh, I do. Uh, before the music, years before the musical, historians differed very much on whether there was an affair between. Uh, between Angelica and Hamilton. 
And uh, one particular one, I forget his name, pointed out that in 1789, um, when uh, Elizabeth went up to Albany to be with her father for several months, um, Hamilton uh, was seen in a carriage with uh, Angelica and paid the rent on the flat that, that he apparently rented for her. And this was, in addition to the correspondence, the language of the correspondence was, was at least convinced him, and I think some other, some other historians, that it was serious. Well, keep in mind, Alexander Hamilton was an attorney, and he was also fairly poor. So um, the money that he paid as blackmail related to Mariah Reynolds was about a third of his income as a, as a government employee. So Angelica Schuyler uh, Church was a very wealthy woman. And he, Hamilton, often handled business for her, her and her husband in the United States because they lived in Britain. So I don't know, and we don't know. It just if I had to, if I had to toss a coin, I would say they didn't. Also, by the way, he never hid his affection for Angelica uh, in front of her sister, and she and her, they would talk a lot yeah. about that very openly about how much they loved each other. So it doesn't speak of a guilty I, conscience I to me. Thank you. Gore Vidal is the only person I know who's um, advanced and elaborate and um, presumably substantial case for some good aspects of Aaron Burr. Did you deal with uh, <laughs> Gore Vidal's, uh, of course he admitted that he was something of a descendant of, uh, <laughs> of, of Aaron Burr's. <laughs> But, but, I mean, Gore Vidal, I mean, he's a, a very smart man and an excellent historian. Well, yes, I read, Gore Vidal famously wrote a book just, just called Burr. And it's really a book, I think it's from the 70s, and it's very much a 70s book. It's very much a book where, like, you know, the goody two-shoes, the government guy, Alexander Hamilton, you know, I don't think he's that great. I think the guy who's really interesting is the guy who was like the sexy, you know, carried on with you know, his wife, I mean, not his wife, he, with, um, when, before he married Theodosia, she was married to somebody else. He carried on her with her while she was married to this other person. He had other affairs. He wrote to his daughter about his affairs. Ow, that hurts my ear. Um, so, you know, Gore Vidal kind of liked that. Gore Vidal thought that was just sort of clever. And to me, it, it just felt like a 70s book. I mean, I, of course, I read it more recently well, than that. That's a great book, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't like his book on Lincoln either, so uh -huh. there you go. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> oh, I think the next person's back. Yes. Uh, two quick questions. One, when you started this, you must have had a pretty good idea of what Hamilton was like and so on. What great changes in your scholarship uh, changed what you think about Hamilton now? And secondly, uh, what does Hamilton mean for the present and the very future of America? Thank you. I think my opinions changed partly of, per, of his personality. You know, again, I had always seen him portrayed and heard of him as sort of a coldly rational person, and it's quite clear to me he was a very, very deeply emotional person, in fact, and uh, felt very deeply about many things. And I think I also, I certainly understood once I learned about his background that, you know, somebody who's, who dies next to his mother, who's his only really living relative, and he's, you know, 11, 12 years old at the time that that happens, and then has to carry on. It made me understand his, his personality much, uh, much more deeply. But the other thing, too, I have to say, again, I think because of our presentation, we have these protagonists, antagonists. I thought he would be my antagonist. I thought someone like Jefferson might be the protagonist, and that kind of flipped around for me. Partly because I think we think of Jefferson, et cetera, as being portrayed as the as the real people person, man of the you know man of the people, all men are created equal, you know, really cool lang lingo like that that Jefferson was really good at putting across. But someone like Alexander Hamilton actually made it possible for men and women to be more equal, 
And so he was, uh, that's the curious thing. He was always portrayed as this elitist, you know, really, really only looking out for the wealthy. And yet that's almost the exact opposite meaning of his life. So in terms of his meaning for today, I, I, you know, I think of several things. I, I walk past the Treasury Department. I'm not from D.C. You're all so lucky to see these things all the time. And, and I noticed that in the, looking through the window of the Treasury Department that um, there were water stains <clears throat> in one of the offices on the ceiling. And I thought, that's sad. You know, this is what a great edifice Hamilton built and that the American people have sustained all these years, and, and we need to treasure those things because that's our home, and we need to we need to keep it in good repair. And the other thing, of course, in this election season of all election seasons, we ought to be learning something about political violence and the importance of not inciting it. Thank you for writing this very important book. Um, as a long time, uh, as a person who lived for many years in Virginia, I believe the third uh, item on uh, Jefferson's list was uh, writing the uh, religious freedom, uh, Virginia religious freedom uh, bill. And I think that was a significant contribution, especially since it very obviously tied into the, uh, the religious amendment in the Bill of Rights. Yes, and by the way, let me say, and I so appreciate your bringing that out. And what happens when you write a novel, which is different when you write a true nonfiction <laughs> book, is if you're writing nonfiction, as I do a lot, you really feel like you must, you know, bring out both sides of those questions and really, in a full way, acknowledge the contributions of everybody. But when you're telling it from Eliza and Alexander's perspective, you know, you just no, I, I it goes down I, differently. I don't question he was a very complicated and, and, and um, in many ways, a, a difficult person, obviously. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just curious if you think that there was genuine affection between Hamilton and uh, Maria uh, Reynolds. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm also curious, um, I guess it's a little murky about whether uh, Eliza ultimately forgave Hamilton, but I was also curious if she forgave uh, Maria as well. Well, I doubt that she could have forgiven Mariah. That's how they always Mariah, pronounce okay. her name, by the way. No, one doesn't know if you're just reading it. Um, I think, I think she does forgive him. Again, this is a part of the novel. So you have to, you know, you get a chance as a writer of fiction to work through emotional truths that you cannot really delve into as a nonfiction writer. So it was a fun thing for me. I think she does, but why she does is something you have to, why I think she does, is something you'll know by reading the book. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, whether she forgives Mariah Reynolds, I think is an entirely different thing. And I'm sorry, was there first part of your question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just was curious if you thought there was genuine affection. Oh, genuine Hamilton. affection. You know, I think Mariah Reynolds was pretty dang crazy. And uh, <laughs> talk about a drama queen. I mean, she really, she just, in her letters, it was like, you know, oh, you've got to come now. I'm going to kill myself. I just, you know. So she got more and more hysterical, and he kept going to see her. So actually, I think he was, in, a, in his own sort of way, trying to care for her. I don't think he could have loved her. With I think he was infatuated. And that's part of the interesting thing, is to try to write about what happens when infatuation takes over the brain and other parts. <laughs> and, and then how that just overwhelms good judgment. It can, I've heard. So there was actually, I brought a copy of the Reynolds pamphlet, and there was a section that indicates perhaps why he stayed with Mariah Reynolds even after he begins you know, being extorted by her husband. And I'll just read a section. My sensibility, perhaps my vanity, admitted the possibility of a real fondness and led me to adopt the plan of gradual discontinuance rather than of a sudden interruption, at least calculated to give pain if a real partiality existed. So he may have tried to convince himself that it was real, whatever it was. And tried to wean her off without breaking her heart. But she was crazy. She was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, well, if you um, could just remind us again, you know, what you have coming up. I know you have a, an event in New York soon, and there's, a, there's something that you picked
picked up on your travels for your research, and I'm wondering oh, if you could yes. share with our audience what you yeah. plan on doing in New York with it. Okay, well, let me tell you two things. First of all, I actually have an event here tomorrow. I am a documentary filmmaker. If you want to come see the movie, my book, The Movie, uh, called American Umpire. It's being sponsored by American Public Television and by WETA here in Washington. Jim Lair is the narrator. Uh, Jim Shelley, who's here, is the um, uh, director and co-producer. And that's a special screening. It's going to air on WIDA in um, September 23rd, 9.30 p.m. on your local station. But tomorrow, if you want a sneak preview, you can come to the Cato Institute at 4 o'clock. Um, and then also, I am going to New York. And, uh, and I appreciate so much Ruth mentioning this because when I went to Nevis, uh, I got on the, his home, his birth home, is right there on the shore. And I went down to the beach because I thought, well, Hamilton, when he was a little boy, must have been on this beach. You know, must have his mom must have taken him to this beach. And I got a shell, and I've had that shell for I think about four years now because I always thought, well, if my if my book gets published, I can take the shell and put it on his grave at Trinity. So I have it with me, <laughs> and I'll get a chance to to lay it at his, at his grave this Wednesday. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Elizabeth Cobbs.